Okay, so hello. This is the meeting now, I think. I hope it is. Uh, it's procedural generation. That's what I'm going to talk about and then later do some of, and then you'll also do some of that probably at the same time. But first, there's a programming competition this Saturday. Um, if you want to do that, which I highly recommend, we'll be helping people register after this because there's been some problems with the system. So you got to do it a specific way. But so, uh, some more details, sorry. Uh, some more details. Uh, it'll be uh, teams of three. Um, and no experience is needed. Um, so even if you've only got, you know, CSC 150 under your belt, uh, that's totally fine. Uh, it's going to be set up the same way we have our caddis problems set up. Uh, if you go to competition um, at dsuprov.club um, and uh, be sure to go uh, take attendance while I'm talking. So anyway, um, so yeah, there's no pressure at all. Uh, you don't have to have any of them solved. Uh, it's just a great opportunity to kind of get your feet wet. Um, in the competition landscape. So if you're interested, but don't feel like you're qualified, do not worry, because there's no pressure. Uh, there's as many teams as you want. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, uh, please stay after. What yeah. was the website uh, DSU uh, um, Prague. P to Prague. register, there's a different one. Uh, to register, stay after here, and um, I'll help you get registered, because that's uh, not easy, whatever. Uh, so just stay after. Uh, the deadline is tonight, though, so kind of a last-minute decision. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, think about that, and if you have any questions, let us know. Also, it's technically teams of up to three, so if you really hate people, you can still do it alone. You just won't do very well. Three will find it. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Uh, yeah, so continuing on. Procedural generation, what is that? Basically, it's a very broad subject, which is just a computer making things unassisted by the human mind, except it was assisted at the start, but now it's unassisted, and it can go on forever. Uh, usually, this uses uh, random or pseudo-random, because random, true random doesn't exist or whatever. Usually uses random numbers because that's how you do things that are unpredictable. Uh, the primary way of doing this uh, is usually with coherent noise. And uh, before I explain what that even is, I shall explain how it came about. Uh, there's this dude named Ken Perlin who is working on the visuals for the movie Tron, which looked like this. And as he was working on it, he was like, hang on a second. Everything I do looks way too computer generated. I'm going to make it look less so. Uh, so he made this little square here. Not this exact one, but the way to make it. Uh, it's called Perlin Noise, and it's just a blurry little blob that you can use to make things look messier, basically. And so the way that it works is you take a grid and then on each point of the grid, or you could think of it as like each entry in an array, you choose a random angle for a vector to be pointing, off, pointing at, and then you color in, essentially, each point within, like in between those points, depending on like the resolution of your image. That's how you determine how many points. Um, and this is the dot product of the ang like the angle to the closest thing. Basically what it's saying is based on the angle of the closest arrow, it will color it somewhere between negative one and one. So like this little diagonal here is zero because it's at an exact 90 degree angle with its closest thingy. 
Um, and so the dot product ends up being zero. Dot products are kind of complicated, so I don't want to get into it, but basically the dot product of two angles that are at a 90 degrees is zero. Um, whoops. Um, and then you just kind of smooth that together with smoothing stuff. It's also kind of math complicated, but you don't really need to ever implement your own Perlin noise because someone inevitably has before you implemented that and you can just call their function. And so once you've got that blurry blob, you can just kind of make stuff like this. Um, this is made with just like a bunch of different layers of Perlin noise combined together. And then they also did a little bit of lighting trickery to make it look more 3D. But if you just like applied the Perlin noise that was used to make this to a 3D object in a like a 3D game or something, then it would look roughly like this after you applied the colors and lighting. And then also a different example, which I didn't add to the presentation because I forgot about it. Um, Let's see. I should have filmed the image that was the original, but Blake and I were working on a project for a class where we were taking Perlin noise and then trying to recreate it with a, a, with a GAN, with a machine learning thingy. And this is the result of that. But <laughs> if you just imagine this but smoother, then that's what it looked like when it was just made with Perlin noise. So that's another use case. Well, pretty much the same use case, actually. But it's another way you can get something that's just the noise to look decent without any effort. Wrong tab. Oh, and then this. If you want to specifically make this, I added the link to here. So if you're on the slides following along, you can click on that and it's in the tutorials on that page. Different type of noise, Voronoi noise. You just place a bunch of dots on the on a grid and then you color the you color the pixel based on how close it is to the nearest dot. And this is this kind of shows more the grid and then also it colors it in based on distance. But then this GIF is pretty helpful because it shows like um, it shows how those little sections are made essentially because once where the circles overlap are essentially where uh, it's equal distance from between each of the points. Fractals are also are also a form of procedural generation. It's most of them are basically just you do something and then you do it again, but smaller. Here's a tree. Here's the Mandelbrot set. Uh, this one's a lot more complicated than the tree, but the trees just add two branches at the end of each branch. Um, you can do some fun stuff with that if you add in randomness to each layer, like for example the angle that each branch goes off at, then you can essentially have an infinite number of different types of trees. Well, same type of tree. But. A different type of procedural generation is sequence generation, which is just you've got one thing, what's the next thing going to be? Um, this is pretty useful for if you're trying to generate text. A super simple version of this is Mad Libs. They, it may have a professional name, but I couldn't find one. But you essentially just have a bunch of pre-made sentences with things that you can fill in. You can add a whole bunch of complicated rules, or you could just do it as simple as what I put here, and then have a list of adjectives and nouns. Bit more complicated, Markov chains. Um, you just have a whole bunch of words and then all of the words that have followed each of the other words and at what percentage chance they have to follow that word. So if I were to use this block of text in a Markov chain, 
I might say Markov chains keep track of how often each word follows each other words follow other words follow other words because I'm just randomly going through and picking okay I'm at this word what's a word that can go after that one um, usually it's you go usually something will go through a large block of text and say okay of follows um, peace 90% of the time that there is the word peace. Um, so then it can just go through and say 90% of the time that you have the word peace, of should follow it. Here's a different thing, cellular automata. And basically what this is, is you have a starting point and then um, you've got a bunch of rules that say what to do next. Uh, one of the most famous forms of this is Conway's Game of Life over here, where it's basically just cells either live or die based on the how many cells are around them, and you get pretty complex behavior. It passes the Turing test, which means you can um, you can do anything with Conway's Game of Life. You can even make it within itself. It just requires a whole bunch of blocks. And then there's also ways to use cellular automata to generate like caves like this. And essentially you just start with a random pattern, completely random, of um, walls and not walls and you use a set of rules to determine whether something should become a, become a wall or become a not wall based on what it currently is and what's around it. So if it has a bunch of walls around it, it'll become a wall, and then eventually it all congeals into something that's pretty consistent with itself. Uh, I also keep forgetting to ask for questions. Does anybody have any questions about the billion different things I've just breezed through? Okay, good. Or not good, depending on how you feel about questions. Now, that felt pretty miscellaneous, but here's even more miscellaneous because that's how I labeled these slides. Wang tiles, presumably named after someone with the last name of Wang. Um, these, um, like these squares here, are all just um, like each individual square is a tile and the rules for Wang tiles is that each edge has like a color or a category and you just place down a tile and then any tile that you place next to that has to have the same edge color or category and so you get some consistent blocks um, and the way that this is this can be used for like games and stuff is uh, It doesn't matter what's in the middle as long as the edges connect So you can use this to be like, okay, here's a road piece on the left So there needs to be a road that connects on the left side But then above it there is no road and in the center you can just have anything in that tile But then you follow the set of rules to build out this procedurally and eventually you've got a big grid with stuff that doesn't have random cutoff edges. Oh, wrong button. Perlin worms is how Minecraft used to generate its caves before they got all fancy. And as you can see here, it just kind of looks like a bunch of worms, which is why it's called that. But basically what this is, is you just find a starting point and then you pick a random angle and then you keep going and then you kind of change that angle a tiny bit, a random amount, and then you keep going and then you keep on doing that until you decide that it's done or until the random number decides that it's done. And that can generate some, some worms. Okay, now it's time for the example. So, if you're following...
going on along on the slides, you can click on that first link. And if you're not following along on the slides, I would encourage you to do so. Um, but you could also go to thebookofshaders.com. And I need to keep this tab open. There's this link right here. Um, and then you're going to need two tabs for this. It's not the best setup, but it is the best setup that I could find for working with shaders in a way that's easy to understand. Um, also on here, I put a YouTube channel that has done a bunch of stuff with procedural generation, uh, Sebastian Log or Laug. Um, some cool videos if you want to, if you think this is cool. But for the example, if we go to the slash 11 page on here, here's where I got that image from, and scroll down, eventually you get to one of these blocks here. Um, we're going to steal these functions of noise and random. Just copy that and then I need to check to see if there's anything else on here. Yeah. Okay. Then go to page 12. Whoops, that's 112. What? And then eventually yeah, here's an example of Voronoi noise. We're going to just go above the main, add a few spaces, and paste in our functions here. So a quick rundown of how shaders work, or at least how they work in GLSL, which is the language that these ones are written in. Uh, basically, you can think of this program as being run on each individual pixel of this image right here. Um, there are a few weird things like uniforms and uh, the outputs, but basically it's just a function where it's got these inputs here. It has a coordinate which is, let's see, in the main they already grabbed the coordinate um, so you can just use st as the coordinate um, and then you've got the output of what color it's going to be. So just to do a quick example, um, so at the end here for this example you can see that uh, it's setting the color to be this variable color. And up, further up, it's defined as a VEC3, which is essentially just uh, just three floats standing on top of each other in a trench coat. Um, so if we go to color, um, I think we can do plus equals, but we can define a new VEC3 to be 0 0.100 0, 0 using this function here. And then it becomes slightly more red because we've just added 0.1 red, 0 green, and 0 blue to our output color for each pixel. And then to demonstrate how the whole per pixel thing works, I'm going to say that if color.r which is the red of the color. No, wait, I should say X, because I don't know if it has... Nah, I'm going with R. That's a guess. Say if that's greater than 0.5, then that's only when we'll do that, and that's not showing up very well, so I'll switch it to less than. There. Okay, there, that's good. Okay and increase that. So you can see you can do like logical operations 
for the individual color of each pixel. And in this case, uh, if the color um, if the color has less than two less than 0 0.2 red in it, it's switching it's increasing the red a bunch and you can see that manifest as circles because of how Voronoi noise works where it's all condensed into being close to the points there. Um, so now let's just kind of add some random stuff to this. A good math to do for this often is multiplication. Um, so let's go back over to here and pull in the function calls that they used to get the noise from the other thing. Alright, it was like this. These two. Plop them in here. Now we have float n, which is essentially just the color at, of this. We've copied over this square now, essentially, and that is manifesting itself as the value of n. Um, and so we can say that color times equals, um, let's see if n works, yeah. Doesn't seem to work, but if we do this, huh, oh, setting it equals works. can kind of smudge stuff around by adding a fraction of n. So if we keep on decreasing or increasing this, you can have more or less of the noise we brought over taking precedent. I don't really have much else to show. Anybody have any suggestions on something we could try to do with this? Actually, I'm going to try to work in time because that's always fun. I think they have an, an example that uses a time variable. And I just lost my progress on that previous one, but that's fine. Um, yeah, here we go. Um, uniform float u time. Let's see. Since noise is infinite and procedural and stuff. Oh, this one also uses time. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, since noise is infinite and procedural and stuff, we can make everything just kind of shift around. So I'm actually going to go back over to this noise. But you could also uh, just apply this to the this noise that was already in your thing but is no longer in mine because I left the page. Um, in here, you can see that it's setting a position to use in the noise function. That's essentially saying what portion of the noise we're using. Uh, let's just add in where it's setting this. Um, it's called u underscore time in here. Uh, and now it's scrolling. And something's messed up with it, but I think that's the fault of the weird version of noise that they're using. Uh, 
and then we can whoops then we can make this slower This concludes the presentation. <laughs> uh, stick around if you want to join the programming competition. Um, so someone asked, uh, sorry I forgot to mention it the first time. Um, since the qualifier competition um, is on CADIS, uh, it's online. Um, so we'll be meeting up in Beacom. I don't know what room quite yet, but presumably one of the rooms upstairs. Um, so it'll be 1 to 6 this Saturday. Food and drinks will be provided. Uh, usually it's like pizza and pop or something. Um, and so that's usually, and so yeah, no pressure, no experience needed. Um, teams usually solve 0 to 2 problems. So if you don't solve one, like don't feel like you're trash because you're not. Um, yeah, good first experience, see if you like it. This was my first experience in competitions was doing this, um, so I highly recommend. And yeah, qualifier, um, there's no pressure. Uh, this is just kind of deciding, uh, helping us narrow down which teams will represent DSU in the real, quote unquote, uh, regional competition. So, um, if you're interested, uh, like I said, stick around. Teams have up to three, so if you have an idea of people you want to uh, be with, uh, you can message them quick and then let me know. Um, yeah. How many teams are there so far? I do not know, because I, Austin would know, because he's the coach, so he's able to see all the different teams. I know there's at, at least, least two. two right now. There may be more that I am unaware of. So, where is it at? Um, it'll be at Beacon here on Saturday. And how many teams do you expect to qualify? So if it's in person, like I think they're planning on this year, we take three. Um, if it's online, we just take as many as we want. Um, but don't let that stop you, just because, oh no, you don't get to, you might not get to go to regionals. Mm -hmm. Just do it anyway, because <laughs> it's super useful, helpful. Just yeah. kind of gives you a perspective. Because even if you think, oh, I never won a program competitively, when you go to a job interview in the future, they're going to ask you, all right, how would you solve this? And having that background and needing to solve problems quickly can be useful. So Very true. So yeah. And yeah, um, if you aren't able, like if you're going to be out of town this weekend or something, uh, the qual qualifier isn't necessarily required uh, to participate in the regionals later on. Um, but yeah, we do. Uh, if you are around, uh, we definitely encourage it because yeah, if it is in person, then we'll need to narrow down um, some teams. Um, but if COVID goes crazy and we go remote, uh, who knows what does what happens with COVID? So uh, anyway, long tangent. If you have any other questions, feel free to ask. Uh, right now, you can come up to us um, when we're done here, and uh, we can help you sign up. If you only make it to like three of the five hours or like two of the five hours or something like that. Yeah, yeah. that's fine. So I'm busy from two to four, and I would like to go. Yeah, that's really fine. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, you just show up when you can get there. Yep. And then, yeah, more of a question for your team. Like, as long as your team is fine with it, too. It's no big deal. And so, and if you can't be there in person but still want to like do it from home or something, uh, that's uh, what uh, one of our team members will be doing. Aaron will be out of town, so we'll just be doing like a little Discord. So basically, very lax um, and very carefree. So if you're even slightly interested, I highly encourage you doing it. Um, and uh, yeah, no, no big deal with any of it. So there's my two cents. I'll stop. Uh, I'll stop my soapbox. So yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, otherwise, thank you all for coming. Um, we will be here again next week, same time, same place. Um, Aaron will be talking about uh, Firebase, right? Firebase, which is um, what we use to uh, keep, or it's the back end of our website, so we'll get some 
behind the scenes and how our website works. So, awesome. Thanks, y'all. I'll be up here. so that it actually does fill up slowly. There we go. Now it's filling up. How many did we get Can you and I die? Oh, yeah, you did. I should probably end the recording.